we're going to really learn how to uh, interpret these too. Because I mean, this this first uh, episode, which I really didn't, this first lecture, which I hi Jordy, how you doing? Which I I don't think I got it through last time was uh, um, kind of tells us about what a vision is. And the difference between a vision and a uh, and a dream, and it's pretty interesting. I don't know, if it, you know, something I I, I don't know. Jordy's an expert at reading things, but um, you know, uh, it takes me. Uh, you, you know, I'll read something about five times, and then suddenly I, I read it the sixth time, and I say, "Well, was that in there before?" <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's amazing that. Uh, what what can uh, come up here, and what it, you, you know this whole uh, kind of an episode uh, describes is uh, you you know her first direct vision and how it starts, how you do a vision, and then what is the difference between the direct vision, which was her method going forward, and dream analysis, and you know so it's going to be pretty interesting. Jordy, do you ever do any, you do a lot of, uh, you know, like 12 hour meditation sometimes. Do you do, um, have, you know, normally they teach you uh, to go neti neti or, you know, don't, or, or cancel, cancel whenever you have a image come up while you're, while you're meditating. In other words, you're supposed to have it. Yeah. You're on, let me see if I can unmute you. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you can unmute. Yeah, uh, you're muted. Okay. I am. A, do you do you, read, do you read me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. Now, in in meditation, Buddhist Buddhist type of meditation, for all practical purposes, uh, mindfulness should be on the same line. You don't wrestle with yourself. That's the first point. Yes. So it's a matter of training attention. You are supposed to pay attention, for instance, to the air and going through the nostrils. Yes. Talk, talk uh, the bodily functions, what's going on with the body, particularly basically, the respiration. Basically, in, in, in my tradition, basically two. One is, is the breath, and the, the emphasis is in the triangle from the tip of the nose to the corners or this room, focus attention here and ignore the rest. Now, uh, the rest appears about 30 times per minute. Yes, exactly. Four hours. Well, when I did it, and, and see the idea here is to and, uh, activate uh, images in the unconscious. Now, now what happens if it, uh, I have something to share here, huh? mm -hmm. is that at the end of the day, uh, you 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 take notice that something has appeared, mm -hmm. but you allow that to pass. Yes. But again, you have you have noticed, and there is there is an uh, a level of things when when things cross the level that you notice them, somehow means that you are ready to to deal with them. Yeah, and and you know then they even contrast that with. You know, I went through, uh, I mean, three uh, sessions with Michael Harner, you know, on shamanic visioning, yeah. you know, and in, in every single case, there was no transformational aspect to it. It was more of becoming acquainted with your spirit animal, becoming acquainted with the, um, and going on a vision quest to accomplish some task in the outer world yeah. you know? so as is as a medium but i really am thinking of going back and and i don't know what the uh this shamanic center is doing now but i kind of like to after i went back and, and done this you know to to ask them you know the some of the really accomplished visionaries and there's some really good ones um how they did it you know uh how they I, got yeah i had Recently, uh, one week before Christmas, I met uh, a lama which was interested. He was training the Tibet, 
from very young, he was there from ages 10 to 20 or something like that, the Spanish, recruited by the, by the Tibetans. And he developed shamanic skills, like uh, seeing you, what you call for life and what are your assets. Yes, that, that was and something it, that... It made, it made an impression to me. I mean, this fellow had some sort of a gift, certainly. Well, and that was something that um, uh, let's see. Peter Kingsley, hi, Marina and yeah. Jan. Peter Kingsley noticed when he was with uh, the uh, um, with the Native uh, Americans that they the first time he met them, they saw him. They said, we can tell you're from uh, the land of the ancestors, you know, and they didn't even know what he did, you know, and it was just the way he walked. So I mean, there was this this idea of there there's somewhat of a mediumship going on, but anyway, hi Marina and Jan and uh, yeah. get uh, started a little bit, and uh, I'll try to keep some rooms for questions going. Uh, but you know, go ahead, Jordy, if you want. To... I'll be in and out because I am I am multitasking not multitasking somehow, but basically I want to make a clear statement of motivation and interest to be here as okay. active as I, as I can afford. All right. Well, that's, that's great. And if you can't, I mean, we try to have them on again or, or on a YouTube. Uh, yeah. But, um, I, I am reviewing, I'll uh, say that 27, I wasn't here on YouTube, etc. Yes. And okay, great. Again, thank you for everything. And I, highlight my statement of motivation, repeating, I am motivated to stick to me here. Okay. Well, okay. we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, I mean, I, the whole thing is I learned so much more. I mean, if you're going to be reading young anyway, why not do it with a group of people, you know, and then the fact that it forces me, like, you know, I've read the visions seminars before and, but to go through them closely on a close reading, it's not the same. It's it's a lot different. You know, you're, you're, Craig. Yeah. Um, that that's an old, very old issue. Yeah. You learn something really when you teach it. Yes. Well, when you when, try to explain it to to somebody when you else, explain yep. that, you grab the thing differently and you integrate yourself, and then you discipline yourself, your expression, your communication. Uh, the dance with uh, with the people you are talking to, which puts things together in a second twist. I mean, yes, exactly. I mean, there's some sure. kind of a an ener a different energy that forms yeah. in when you're, uh, you're rather than reading it or speaking it or hearing it. You know, they're all three different. Um, I've learned that in learning languages. You know, is one thing to read it, another thing to be able to he hear it, which is yeah. the hardest thing for me. And then the third is speaking. So sometimes I, it's a one-way conversation I have with people. I can speak. No, but, uh, yes and no. Uh, yes and no. It's it's multi-layer. I've, I've been a teacher, a part-time teacher, basically uh, continuous education to senior medical people. And when you have to prepare a presentation like a case study, you will invest five or six hours for a half an hour presentation and role play and uh, imagine uh, the objections that will be a, would be a, a reason, the type of thing. And it's ex extremely fruitful. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, it is very uh, productive for me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I learned so much more since I started doing this. And uh, of course, we went through some really interesting material too. Well, uh, why don't I get started on this? And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, of course, anybody is free to uh, um, interrupt at any time. And hi, Tim and Angel. And yeah. uh, we have a call in person. I'm not sure who it is, but if you can unmute yourself, you can introduce yourself. But um, and Marina and Jan and and anyway, um, again, we're discussing the vision seminars, and the idea here is that the uh, hi, <laughs> thanks, Jan. That the visions of uh, 
of of the black book um, were uh, their their real uh, strength is the fact that their rawness and this and their weakness is their rawness too. I mean, so if 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 we read here, we're going to find. I mean, I think if we do, we just go back and forth from Christiana Morgan's and then do, go do a black book vision. We're we're going to have a more uh, flavor for the uh, what and the 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 one good thing about this lecture last time, which I kind of boggled or bungled last time because it was so busy around here, um, is that uh, um, he kind of introduces what and and Jan, thank you for that thing from the introduction because that was very helpful too on what the vision is. So anyway, we're going to start with this dream. Uh, that she had. Um, just going to go over it one more time. She, this is Christiana Morgan. She finds herself in a graveyard in the devastated areas in France. The graves were made of red sandstone, and she saw people walking over a large grave where many soldiers were buried. Someone said, Look at this gravestone. It was a large tombstone, and upon it was carved the figure of a saint, and beside it, the figure of a bull. And in spite of the fact that both figures were carved in stone, they were alive, half dead, and half alive. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, image, too. I can almost see it uh, on that stone, of, of uh, them being not really alive and not really dead. Uh, and I saw that the bull was gnawing the fingers of the saint. And I feel nauseated with horror and walk away shaking my own hand as though to free from the bull. So she's identifying herself with the saint. And she, the saint is her uh, dominant function, which is thinking. So uh, which has reached its culmination and therefore is sterile. And uh, that, so that's the first part of the dream. And, it, and Jung says it shows her partial identity with the saint. Then we got into it. Now, this is the second part. And this is a response to the first part, the need for a descent. Then she gets into an automobile and drives down a very steep hill. And it seems to her that the brakes of the car might not be strong enough. And I felt very frightened and emotional. But at last, we got down to the bottom of the hill safe in safety. Well, the... Um, we, we kind of find out, found out last time that the bull represents the blind creative force. And uh, I don't know if anyone heard Charles dream about the, his father is the Minotaur and his mother is Isis, you know, I mean, and, and the Minotaur, I mean, it, the bull man is this creative force, you know, and uh, um, so, uh, you, you know, I at the um, on the on New Year's Day, I just happened to do a uh, a uh, heck eaching hexagram, you know, and uh, I I hate it, but I always get this one, you know, and and my uh, uh, usually my question is just uh, this, you know, I just I love you, God, you know, it's just sort of a devotional, but then the um, I get these all the time earth over earth okay the receptive over the receptive you know and uh, now now what this really means is the complement of the earth or the receptive is the creative which is um not the um yin lang lines but the yang lines or the ma masculine lines which represent heaven over heaven so the heaven over heaven is the shaper and earth over earth is the shaped. So this is what is telling me I need to be more earth-like and I need to be the shaped, not the shaper, because I'm in need of shaping. And so this is what uh, Christiana Morgan is in need of too. Uh, the bull, the creative force, you know, uh, and, and at the beginning is the blind creative force. And then I had this dream and it just seemed to be um, similar, you know, 
there were uh, young girls in dresses wearing aprons and long scarves of green and white, I haven't colored this completely, uh, who ran to and uh, fro in a circle in the opening in a forest. And a voice said, the spiritual helped you very much, but shielded you from powerful imagery because of that spirit. So to me, this, this is very similar to the saint that is having its fingers gnawed by the bull, that um, the spiritual aspect in myself has um, shielded me from the powerful imagery of nature itself you know, which is the anima. And that's, that's what we're going to um, start out this, uh, and I'll try to do it in a lot more summarized form. But, um, you know, the difference between a shaman, you know, and a, uh, and a saint, you know, uh, who uh, in this case, represents a culmination, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the saint who has, uh, um, is a product of nature, but is one who's overcome nature. While the shaman is, uh, hi, Adam. The shaman is, uh, um, a, uh, I believe too, uh, Tim, you're going to do an exercise today aren't you at a, around 11 or so or some presentation is that correct yep that's right oh, okay all right I'll, I'll i'll try to finish uh, a little early then okay well um anyway uh, so so just to review you know the shaman accepts the rule ru rule of the anima the shaman is rooted in the anima and uh anima relation it, and yet is a related and a social personage uh, uh, the shaman is a product of nature, depends on nature. So depends on the anima, uh, but the anima is nature. That's the, that's the earth force. Uh, I mean, the anima, the feminine and, and the, uh, and nature and the mother and the, the anima and the life bearer are all related, you know, and they're different than the masculine, the logos, the spiritual. You know, they have a different, um, and yet they're uh, very, um, they're very uh, complementary of each other. Like, um, uh, like the I Ching says that um, heaven is complementary to the earth. The creative is complementary to the receptive, you know. So the, the shaman is enveloped by the unconscious. He is part of it. And the, yet the unconscious functions through him. And the shaman, um, where the uh, saint try to, tries to overcome the power of illusion, the shaman is the power of illusion. And uh, um, he is the, um, the subject and the bearer of image and illusion. And uh, um, then we, we just, the saint... Uh, is um, uh, is rigorously excludes anima relations, forcing him in, into isolated absolutism. Um, is is a product of social and civilized uh, differentiation. You would not really have seen a saint in a uh, in a well. You know, I don't know. You could you could probably name out a few. Chief Seattle, or or Chief Joseph, or some uh, it, uh, you know great figures in in the history of at least American uh, Aboriginal um, life that that had saint like qualities. But the 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 um, idea is that, uh, and we see this later. And this is really where we're going to get into the objective mind. The objective mind is where. We and this is what uh, uh, Jan said in her thing. What what Christiana Morgan learns to do is this great thinking person learns to um, recognize that all of her awareness, 
all of her thoughts, everything that comes into her head, she can view it outside as if it's not her. Now, can you imagine that yourself? You know, um, like you're sitting here thinking right now, put that, that's not you. Try to put it outside yourself and view it from outside. And this is the only time that direct revelation can occur is where the free will is put outside of our awareness and we watch it as if it's an animal and not us. And at that point, uh, that's where Jung says that, that direct revelation starts to occur and the visionary process is, it's really key to the visionary process. So, but the saint is the product of civilized differentiation. Uh, it, he's, uh, he lifts himself above the unconscious. He defeats the unconscious and he calls it the devil. You know, the saint says, I defeated the devil, but he really just defeated the unconscious. He defeated nature. He defeated um, uh, what we call the realm of images and the realm of illusion and rose above it, you know, and yet he's not quite like the Buddhist uh, saint who, um, you know, uh, uh, rises above uh, nature. He sort of remains somewhat, uh, I guess, you know, um, the difference between compassion with attachment and compassion without attachment. You know, uh, compassion without attachment is the bodhisattva way, you know, to be compassionate, but you're not, uh, it, it is where you never leave. Uh, there, there's just this aspect of the saint, the Christian saint that is not, has a, has a aspect that where he doesn't really totally defeat the unconscious. You know, there's, um, he's always, uh, plagued by the devil too you know he always follows him around you know but um anyway he's supposed to fulfill the unconscious and he's a production of the unconscious and he also is the overcoming of the unconscious so i mean th this th this just shows young says that the uh that the nature of the unconscious is paradoxical it seems to both want to overcome itself and defeat those who overcome itself at the same time. And this is very similar to the realm of the mother. You know, does the mother want her son to go out and uh, be out in the outer world? Or does she want him never to leave her, you know, and devour her? You know, so the, the son that goes on the hero journey is the one who has left the mother world, you know, where the one the, that is the uh, Puer Eternus or something, is the one who never leaves the mother world, you know? And so the mother both loves her son so much, she wants him to succeed, but she loves him so much, she doesn't want him to succeed and leave her and marry some other girl, you know? And uh, then she becomes the mother-in-law. She comes, becomes the, the old witch, you know? Uh, not all in all cases, but, you know, it's just this sort of the symbol of the, of the uh, role of, uh, at least the perception that some people have of, of, of a mother-in-law. She is no longer the mother. She has uh, achieved a, a negative role because she is standing in the way of the son and his um, hero journey, you know, by holding him back a little bit, you know. So um, anyway, uh, Young says that knowing what the saint is really after and the symbols in which he believes uh, it just says it's trying to overcome the unconscious which he calls evil and the devil okay now the aspect of the uh, mother or the unconscious both wanting to uh, uh, to uh, defeat it and fulfill itself but not wanting to at the same time a yay and an a uh, is um, is uh, just the example of rhythmical nature. You know, uh, I, I saw one time someone did a diagram of the, the life, the diagram of the life cycle of a tree, you know, and it just grows in a straight kind of a line like this. 
until it dies, you know. But then the the uh, the life cycle of a human being goes like this. It's all undulation till it reaches a peak, and then it starts to undulate on the descent. But it's always a rise and a fall, and a rise and a fall. And it's really is inflation and depression. It's systole and diastole. You know, it is go it is embracing the world, and then coming back inward to digest your embracing of the world. So, and those, and we need that polarity, you know, in our, order to grow. And that's what, what he says too, about um, the, the, um, the unconscious, he'll say it in a second here, um, the, uh, the patient that he had um, uh, that was insane, had these wonderful dreams, which she was pretty much unaware of, but uh, their meaning, but she'd tell Young, and he could see this. Uh, you know, in, in the winter dreams, they're destruction dreams. The world is empty. She's almost non-existent. You know, there's nothing happening. It's it's all going back down into the negredo. And then in the spring dreams, uh, the positive symbols occur. The sun rises. Dreams take on a lovely aspect. Something feels right, uh, and uh, and you think now it's coming. But it doesn't come. Uh, it does come first, the beautiful symbol of the individuation or rebirth. But, um, and you think she must see it, but she doesn't because she has no hands. She can't grasp it. Um, and so it passes by as, as sort of this uh, miracle, this lovely vision. And Young says, which happens somewhere, not in her, perhaps on a faraway star. He says, I mean, this is just a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, I was the guardian of, uh, of my cousin had schizophrenia and um, it's, it's just sort of a, uh, they have all, so much, so much of this imagery that's so beautiful going on in them, you know, but like Young says, they're like the lame man who is uh, by the healing pool and is so lame they can't get in and heal themselves, you know. So anyway, it's just... Uh, um, the unconscious sometimes seems intent on destruction where everything is fall, uh, dissolved and everything goes under. And this is the process of death and rebirth. This is what we're really seeing happen, happening uh, is that anything that reaches a culmination like the saint needs to have its fingers nibbled by the creative force, the ball who's the symbol of spring dreams, you know, the bull and the ram in, in astrology are the symbol of, of spring, you know, and uh, they're the symbol of the creative force where the saint represents the autumnal equinox. He says, you know, the, the culmination of everything that's beautiful and good and sterile, you know, I mean, the saint tends to, since he's overcome not only the unconscious, but overcome nature, ha, tends to be celibate, you know? And so he's not very Dionysian, he's very solar, you know? And the unconscious wants symbol making. And the only way the unconscious can have symbol making is to have this um, destruction, this creative destruction, you know? There must be, whatever has reached its, its zenith must be destroyed. The king must die. You know, this is this was the what um, James Fraser wanted to call the golden bow. You know, the king must die, and this means that this this highest thing in ourselves must descend. You know, and that was really what the um, second half of the, her dream means. Uh, so um, uh, then, then we can get to the second half of the dream is the descent, okay? Now, the first part of the dream was mythological, you know, um, very mythological. And then the second part of the dream is one we've all had, you know? I mean, I, I've had it many times. I know uh, we've heard some dreams that did. Uh, the automobile is driving down a very steep hill and the dreamer, is driving and fears the brakes may not hold. 
The dreamer is frightened and impotent, but at last um, reaches the bottom of the hill in safety. So the descent is necessary, okay? Because of the culmination of the saintliness and the good thing, the desired thing is now sterile. And it's, um, he says, it, the reason the descent is, is the good thing, the desired thing is always thought of being as above and visible, you know, and uh, uh, the town built on a mountain cannot remain hidden. So we need to descend, but, um, but to find the creative principle, uh, when the thing above has lower efficiency, one must go down to the blind thing, you know, to the unformed and, uh, that, uh, you know, like for instance, Young went down to Salome, you know, the dark thing, which is always thought of being below. And this is, uh, this is an image in all myth of the creative force of the, what's called the nekya. You know, it's the descent to the dead. Any unsolvable dilemma, any unanswerable question, the only way you can solve it is to descend to the oracular cave. And that's either within us when we do our active imagination or uh, actually doing it for real. You know, uh, the, the hidden spring where the prophetic vapors rise, you know, the secret places below. And, uh, you know, he mentions some examples, the caves of Mithra, and the original fathers of the church, you know, were in the catacombs, which is where the dead are literally, you know, at natural uh, cave grottos, which were crypts. And then Norman churches tried to simulate this by having crypts underneath the churches. Uh, and this is where the mystery uh, was performed. The mystery is underground. It's in the depths. The creative forces the creative principle uh, which is symbolized also by somewhat by the kabiri and the telesphorus you know uh, that must be faced and assimilated to consciousness are below and to attain that goal one must go down into the depths and there we will meet the bull or another creative symbol uh, equivalent to the bull you know uh, that is um, this, this blind creative force, the unformed, which is going to create a new synthesis. And yet it has a very aggressive, violent energy in, in the beginning. You know, I mean, it, it has this uh, aspect, but it is um, it's very powerful, but it needs the, um, in, in order to create the synthesis, this wonderful energy, needs to be united with um, ego consciousness, you know? Uh, and uh, so anyway, um, then we, we come to the question, are the brakes of the car uh, strong enough? Now, this is, this is what, um, why do we have these dreams? And why, why is there this dangerous aspect? The, because it threatens ego and it threatens the dominant function and the ego and the dominant function know it because the only way the synthesis can happen is for the ego to sacrifice and for the dominant function to stop functioning you know uh because otherwise it blots out everything you know and so the descent is very steep and dangerous to ego uh to her intellect and uh, he he just mentions that the as ascent to to her thinking a dominant function may be laborious, you know, it took a long time to get there, but it's well trodden and there's many safeguards and the ego, ego always feels safe, you know, and the thinking function always feels safe. But the downward path the, to the inferior functions, which in her case are feeling and sensation, we don't, we're totally, um, who's in charge now? See, that's why the car that's going down there's no one driving it. The brakes don't work. The steering wheel doesn't turn. That's because when we do the descent to the inferior functions, ego 
and its dominant function are losing the guiding principle, you know? And so now, and, and the reason it, it becomes, um, there's, there's an acceleration, the slippery surfaces uh, is, is uh, for instance, in the snow dream that Tim had, where he slides down the snow, um, is uh, it's, it, it, this path is unknown and unfamiliar to the ego. You know, it's a road that's not straight and, and uh, uh, it's serpentine and you get lost easily. You know, Parsifal gets lost easily, you know. And uh, so this is not all, a dream like this does not seem very encouraging. You know, an ego, <laughs> ego is afraid. And, uh, uh, you know, um, an ego is what got us to where we are safely. And this is not, this seems, um, it's so unfamiliar, you know? And, and the, the idea though is, is the annihilation of ego or the loose loss of control, you know? And, uh, and it can, he says, be accompanied by symptoms. Sometimes people actually do fall. But I'm, I mean, what I notice myself is it just, I fumble when I fix things, you know? Like I was fixing something yesterday for my wife and, with super glue, and of course, I drop the super glue, glue, and it goes in a little crack. And then we got to stop everything and move it, and so we find the little tube of super glue. But you, you know, it's just your. This is not my superior function, and so I'm very fumbly, or I get lost, take wrong turns, uh, even on familiar roads, I take wrong turns all the time. And so this descent involves the loss of ego control and the acceleration. Is means what acceleration means. Well, they're the same thing, the loss of ego control. And the acceleration means an uncontrolled movement downwards where we can't control the speed and we can't control the direction. And so, but at the end of the dream, you know, the dream assures her that she's reached the bottom safely. And this happens in probably every dream I've ever had like this. You know, in fact, the car completely goes off the road you know, yet um, nothing happens. There's not really a, a bad accident. It just comes back on the road. Somebody's guiding, you know. Uh, Tim's, your dream of that descent is just very beautiful about this aspect of that it dry, starts to almost drive itself, you know. And so then, um, so we're safe for the time being, of course, but that we haven't achieved anything, you know, but we're at the place where the symbol can can form, you know, to start to form. And then uh, Young mentions, and Jan put this in uh, her, uh, uh, the, the item from the introduction on the very interesting um, exercises that um, Christiana Morgan and her friends, I think one of them was a friend of Eugene O'Neill, uh, the playwright, um, they, they developed this very, and Young discovered that she could see her thinking function objectively. And that means that her awareness is over here and everything that happens in her awareness happens over here. So, I mean, she's really established a distance from this cycle, uh, this um, loop, uh, cassette loop that goes on in our head and she can see it happening and say, that's not me, you know, everything, all those thoughts, all those emotions, all those, that everything that comes into my head is not me. Now that's young says is when we have learned to give up our free will and the free will is now over here and we're no longer because of our descent because of giving up the thinking function, because uh, we went into the realm of the inferior functions. Now, um, that free will, if we learn how to, to um, treat our awareness objectively, that means not subjectively. In other words, it's over here. We can see it operating. Like right now, uh, you know, I want waffles, okay? Well, we can look over here and say, 
it wants waffles now. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not me that wants waffle. It wants waffles. You know, and so I mean, that's kind of the the idea there that of this objective. And he he mentions this uh, too exactly. Uh, so Jung just says that the strata of the historical mind, the top strata is consciousness. The second strata is the consciousness of our youth. In other words, it informs us. You know, it's not with us right now, just these memories. They inform us. And also there is a, uh, it also creates a sense, a certain sense of longing and, uh, it has a guiding principle as the, I mean, at least in my own memories of youth, there's a, a great deal of longing and, and wish to return, you know, but uh, that's the consciousness of you, of our youth. And then there's also the consciousness of the knowledge of our known ancestors, our parents and our grandparents and our aunts and our uncles and, and also of our unknown ancestors. You know, we know something about their biography. And that also informs us at a little more of a remote level. And then there is, of course, the deep past, uh, which we're not, we're completely unaware of. And then very much further down, and this is where we're getting to the realm Christiana Morgan found, uh, the, uh, the man who does not possess his thought to whom his awareness seems outside of him, something in objective and includes all of the archetypal energies, which now reside not in me. They reside in birds, in animals, in water, in trees, in bodies, and in rocks. And, uh, uh, you know, here's just some of the examples. Uh, and we just talked about the one, but, um, I don't think, it thinks, it speaks. Um, an animal or bird told it to it. You know, um, the, uh, it, it heard trees whispering to themselves in the night telling secrets. So now this is the objective mind. Uh, and yet it is something that is awareness available only to us. But now we're looking at it as if not, it, we're not identifying with it. We're identifying with being the witness to it, you know, not with all of that whirlwind of the thoughts that occur in our head. You know, I want this, I want that. You know, it wants this now. It's crazy. Did you notice that? But you're talking about yourself, you know. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, Jung says that all original revelation takes place at the level where the mind is objectified, where we are the witness to our own awareness. So we've given up our free will. We have made the descent. We have sacrificed ego. We have given up our free will. Our free will now not, doesn't reside in us. It resides in this objective, in it. It's doing that. So as it's doing that, we're not doing it. We think when, when, when we think we're doing it, then we think, well, that's just my free will. I really do want waffles right now, you know, but how do you know you really want waffles? And anyway, uh, the, the, uh, um, this, this, and Young gives this wonderful example, you know, uh, which is um, he uses an analysis and we can use this too as our own technique, is uh, um, uh, that this, this, the way that it used to operate, where we would get all our messages, all our thoughts from birds, from trees, from, from the river, from the lake, from the mountains, from a rock, you know, um, it still occurs. And Jung gave the example where um, he has a, an Alisan who has a dream about a cocoon. And he says to her, well, what do you have to do with cocoons? I have no idea. And Jung says, well, this is not a very productive conversation. What do you think I have to do with cocoons? And what do I think about cocoons? 
And then suddenly she could just say, oh, I know exactly what you think about cocoons. And then she goes on and on about what Jung thinks about cocoons. This is not what Jung thinks. This is her objectifying what um, the dream about the cocoons was, you know? Uh, so she is, she is now uh, experiencing the objective mind because all these thoughts that came in her head about what Jung thinks are actually um, the objective mind in her. And she is separated from it and she sees it happening as if it's an outside event. She identifies it with Jung's thoughts, but it really is something that just came out of her when she was asked the question, you know? And uh, um, so you can apply this technique to the inner world, you know? Um, for instance, if you want to ask uh, the great mother a question, um, uh, you could ask the anima, you could say to the anima, um, or to the animus, what do you think the great mother thinks? And then have the animus or the anima tell you what they think the great mother thinks. And then you go ask the great mother and then you compare notes, you know, you've, you've interrogated the witnesses separately, you know? And so then you have, um, now, now who did this? It did that. So when we do this, it is the objective mind. You know, we've um, stepped back from it. So we have made a descent We've given up free will or the dominant function, the one we navigate by, and we have let something else in us speak, you know, and this is now, um, does, could we have just some comments on this? Is anybody, does anybody, uh, does that excite anybody? What about you, Gary? You know, I mean, kind of is a good technique, I think. I was just having a conversation with my anima this morning, and um, I wish I had I'd had this idea before, because that would have been really helpful to squeeze a little more out of her. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, at, okay, you can go to another figure and ask her, what do you think the anima thinks? You know, I mean, in other words, you can have a three-party conversation. It's not just you and the anima or you and another, the great mother, or you and the animus, or, or you and the shadow, you know, or you and uh, uh, any other figure that occurs in a dream. You can say, um, not, you can say, well, what do you think about it, Craig? I don't know, I can't think of anything. I don't know, I have any idea what I'm gonna ask. And, and then, you know, I don't know where to start. So then you can go to, uh, the anima and, and ask the anima, uh, who, what do you, questions do you think I should ask the great mother about this? You know, and then she'll come up with a bunch of really nice questions. You can ask her and then you can ask the great mother the questions, you know, but, but the idea of course here is that we want to let, we want the consciousness, the, the searing light of free will and ego to empty itself and let the unconscious, the other side of the tree, which needs leaves to, to have leaves, you know, and not be, uh, you know, all on the conscious side. We want the unconscious side to de develop its own photosynthetic uh, growth, you know? And uh, so anyway, this, this is very helpful, I think. And, th and this is why, I go ahead, Jordy, did you have a question? Well, more than a question, a comment. I have a, I have what the clinicians call a resistance here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, basically, by my Buddhist training, mm -hmm. at some point when you are an experienced meditator, something happens spontaneously that you see yourself from outside. Mm -hmm. Saying it's a Jordi is angry or cool or having warm or whatever, objectively, as if we're not yourself. You activate something which is translated for the witnesser. Mm -hmm. Some sort of a, a vision from above. And it's something you, you have not to seek, it happens. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's close to what you say, you are in peace, 
and you are connected to the world at, the, at this moment. You are a single creature more, part of the mosaic. Now, by training, uh, I am inclined to be very passive here and enjoy the moments without attachment. Now, they are revelatory, but uh, dreams resist to be evoked. They integrate themselves or part of them. That's my experience. That's why I'm here because I want, I want to explore that uh, in a more active way. My dog wouldn't stop barking. But anyway, uh, uh, yes. Now, see, the one thing that we need to keep in mind here is um, uh, there are different pathways to what, what you, and you just mentioned at the end that there, you are having some revelations. You know, and, and Sri Ramakrishna had all kinds of revelations. You know, I mean, he would uh, tell them. But I mean, in the idea in this Western path, you know, and, and Young will say later, when the Indian turns into the Chinaman, uh, she was very knowledgeable about Taoism, but he is saying, that's not going to serve you. It's all beautiful and it's good. And we love Lao Tse and we love the Tao Te Ching, but that's not you. So it, you, your use of that is artificial. Uh, but the idea here, and this is sort of the, um, the is a, a path that, that um, started to develop even before the cave painters in Lascaux and, and uh, uh, is the one of personal myth creation, you know, creating our own myth. And the way we do this is through symbol creation. And, that, and we just un, uh, went through the, 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 in, uh, her, the schizophrenic patient which has this cyclic nature of destruction and creation in her dreams. The idea is that if there was not destruction and creation in the unconscious, it would not move. It wouldn't be alive. The only way it can be alive is to have um, birth and death. If it doesn't have birth and death, you're living in the world of the fairies. I mean, you're living on the fairy hill uh, where they, no one ever dies and no one ever needs anything. But what do they lack? They lack the promise of youth, which is the growing thing, the symbol, the synthetic. And the only way that can, can happen is through a death and a rebirth. And that's why uh, a lot of uh, very dangerous dreams that we have and symbolize that something in us needs to die. And until it dies, the new thing can't emerge. You know, so it's this. This is a very um, earthy path, too. You know, and uh, it, this is as this is not a contradiction of of, of Buddhism. Um, of course, uh, you, you know uh, you can look at the Buddhism of of, of uh, Ceylon, of China, and Japan. And they're all different, you know, uh, or Tibet, you know, they're a different, uh, and, and some of them have more imagery and some of them don't. I mean, who, what, what are the Tibetan monks doing with their sand painting, their mandalas? You know, there's some aspect there, uh, that's meditation, but um, they, they usually create a, a four, some kind of a quaternary, you know, but um, anyway, so uh, at least for the, go ahead. Uh, two brief points. The, the, the Tibetan Buddhism, it's much more uh, rich in shamanism than the, yes. than the Chinese, which is a variation of Taoism or the, mm -hmm. the one I, I know, which is the Southeast Asian, the, the Theravada tradition. Which is it's related to the bone religion. It's B O N. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and of course, you know, um, Zen is informed by Shinto too. Yeah. You know, uh, so and then of course uh, the the Buddhism of China is informed by Taoism. 
you know, yeah. and I'm not really sure about Southeast Asia, which would be Vietnam and Burma and Thailand. And it, yeah, but I'm sure that they have indigenous aspects as well, but I don't know about them. In a way, it's a most primitive one. Now, the things you mentioned, it raises the issue when you are talking about the, the symbol, the issue of awareness versus sense versus meaning, mm -hmm. which yeah. in mu musical terms are in different octaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They be very, they, they have a, an autonomy meaning here. Yes, and uh, the both uh, sense, both sense of the felt sense and making sense of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is um, um, that is very. I I guess you know when we're we're talking about, of course, the black books, and then Christiana Morgan's visions. Uh, you know, um, they they really have to do with the alchemical uh, method of symbol creation of of creating the philosopher's stone or, or, the, um, or the divine child within us, which is all has to do with creating a personal myth that is unique to us, you know, but also can inform if there is a developing myth in a small society, can inform that whole uh, small society. Of course, it can inform a great civilization. Then you have to, <laughs> you have to go to uh, the age of the water bearer and the Pisces and everything. But do you think uh, think the Lakota Sioux uh, had much to do with the, with the age of Pisces or the age of Aries or the water bearer? Uh, they didn't need it because they, um, and I, I don't know if they had 2,600 year cycles either, you know, but anyway, why don't we just, uh, I'm gonna try to finish this up uh, uh, pretty quick so we can move to the next um, lecture, which is gonna tell us about the, uh, the actually two first visions. So anyway, we've kind of got to the idea of that the um, uh, giving up of the uh, sacrifice, which Jung is saying is almost like a black mass. It's almost like Abraham sacrificing Isaac, you know? I mean, we're, um, we're giving up uh, our most valued possession to achieve something that we don't know about is unknown, you know? So, um, uh, but anyway, the proof that Christiana had reached this level is uh, um, that uh, she, the level of objectifying is that from that, the point on from this vision that we're just gonna talk about here in a second and on, she, everything she did was through direct vision, but, I want to talk quickly about the first vision because it's very interesting. Um, you know, uh, uh, the um, we talked about the um, intellect as being this bird of prey that seizes things, which distresses the feeling type uh, because it's killing something, and uh, and then the thinking person is distressed by the feeling function person who does thinking, you know, because it's as rude and uncouth, you know. Uh, so anyway, we're talking about, uh, he's actually introducing this, but uh, he really brings it up because of the visions. Now let's just listen to her vision and you tell me what's missing. You should have read it in the text, but you tell me what's missing because it's, uh, that's the point, I think the whole lecture. Um, this is a vision, it's not a dream. I beheld the head of a ram swiftly uh, and with fearful strength, the ram charged and was met uh, full on the forehead by the uh, spear of an Indian, okay? Then the ram vanished, the Indian lay down by his spear and suddenly he leapt to his feet, jumps on his horse, which was black and gallops over plains and hills and he come, until he comes to the black pond surrounded by the black mountains. And the horse refuses to go on further, uh, lie, uh, lays down and dies. And the Indian uh, stands and uh, uh, on the shore looks for the sun, but the sun had set, it was twilight. And suddenly the in, 
Indian turns into uh, an Oriental person who kneels down beside the black pond and bows his forehead to the earth three times. Okay, now uh, that is her vision. Okay, and we're going to discuss this in depth next time. But um, now what Young is asking is what is the difference between this and a, uh, and a dream? And uh, he got a lot of comments, but the one that he finally said was correct was it looks like a film strip. Uh, it has no emotional content in it. Now compare that with her, he, he mentioned several other dreams uh, before, which had all kinds of feeling content and emotional content, where this one has, it's so stark. I mean, you can almost see it in, the, uh, in her painting you know, uh, of it. Um, here is one. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, shoot. Let's see here. I think I got so many photos on here. I can't find it, but oh, here it is. Here it is. There we go. See, now this is the image of him standing on the shore, uh, looking at, for the sun near the black mountains and the black pond and the horse died. You know, and Young says, Christiana didn't mention anything about that she felt sorry for the horse dying. And the Indian didn't seem to care if the horse died either. You know, I mean, there's just no feeling function in here at all. And all of her dreams had the feeling function in them. But there's no feel. Why is it devoid of feeling? And Young is saying, this is explained that this is a compromise or where the dream isn't a compromise this is a compromise between the conscious attitude and the unconscious so in the and, and young says this usually happens a lot in first visions that um the uh the thinking function is still snuffing out feeling and uh uh it um it is a, uh, so it's not just, the visions are not just a product of the unconscious. Uh, uh, he says, otherwise there would be a mood. Now the moods develop later, but he's just talking about the early visions. Her conscious attitude excludes feeling. And from that, you can see how the visions work. First, the unconscious operates. She does not know what is going to happen. This is the objective mind. And then the images appear suddenly, unexpectedly, and it proves their unconscious activity. But normally, the, her unconscious, which is very emotional and full of feeling, uh, is, uh, shows another factor operating because there is no emotion or feeling in this vision. And since her dominant function is thinking, it extinguished the feeling. So the original picture, which unconscious was trying to bring up is picked peculiarly denaturalized by this searchlight of intellectual consciousness. It's still too strong. And yet she's not really using her free will, but it still is this compromise in the early stages. The intellectual consciousness is still, still too strong. And so what she sees or we see is the compromise between the unconscious and uh, consciousness. And she doesn't do this consciously. She doesn't blot out the feeling, uh, but, uh, and, and it's happening outside her. Uh, conscious thinking is there, but it's exteriorized. And so she left her intellectual attitude out in the yard. And now someone else is playing upon it and it is the unconscious. So uh, the unconscious is trying to use her, her consciousness, but it doesn't know how to use the instrument yet. I mean, uh, this, this is what happens in, in alchemy, you know, when you, or in active imagination, it takes a long time for the unconscious images to become accustomed to the light of ego, you know, and, and it takes a lot of, uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, practice to, for both the unconscious, which is alive and knows what it's doing, 
but it's in a very, very different place. So what happens is, is consciousness approaches the borderline phenomena, which Jung says unconscious is, and the con- unconscious approaches consciousness. You know, and at that at one point when it's moved this far and this we move that far, then then there's a little bit more. Um, of course, this this is something that is, is we're really um, uh, are far away from. Um, I want to. He, he talks uh, about the feeling function, but you know, just basically uh, as a as a uh, uh, summary, uh, the the feeling function is the function of value. Okay, what something is worth, and as he says says there's no metaphysical beauty in the thinking function. It's a cold instrument of, of the uh, ego, of, of the willful ego. He's, he says also the feeling function that's very differentiated is not all warm and loving. It's also cold and is used by ego, ego sometimes for not it's entirely unselfish purposes. So, uh, and, and he said, he showed this other, and I showed this last time, but I don't know if I can show it, but, um, you know, uh, her, she had this aspect of her where thinking and intuition were her dominant functions. And so her two unconscious functions, sensation and feeling are mixed up together, you know? And so she's not really sure what sensation is or feeling is. And they get kind of where uh, they, he says in Germany, no one would ever mix up intuition with feeling because they're the in, introverted intuitive land, you know, where in the United States where we're extroverted thinking, we mix up intuition, sensation, and feeling, you know, they're all, they all, we can call any one of the three feelings. You know, I have a feeling, uh, uh, my toe doesn't feel good. You know, um, I feel great love for this person. I have a feeling something's gonna happen tomorrow. You know, I mean, the idea is we don't distinct, differentiate between those three functions. Okay. So, yes, go ahead. Um, so he says, um, we cannot deny that the feeling is somewhere. Right. So does this indicate that if you, if you have uh, perhaps a dream like this, that's, that's strangely devoid of feeling that the feeling is still somewhere? Yes. He says it is somewhere, but he can't find it. You know, he doesn't see where it is. I mean, a lot of the participants were saying the Indian was feeling, you know, or the horse was feeling. You know, and Young said, well, it may be, but he says he didn't, he didn't get, uh, see that. And what he thinks is uh, feeling is extinguished. But I think this is a particularly peculiar dream too. And by the way, I'm turning it over to you and, uh, uh, and Gary right now. And uh, you guys uh, take over the time from now on. Um, I hope if you if you want to uh, talk about it, maybe you could spend three or four minutes if anybody has any questions. But otherwise, I'm just going to turn it over to Tim and Gary. Now, we'll 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 pick up again on interpreting the, that vision. So go ahead, Tim. It's all yours. All right. Um, I don't know, Gary, if you've got anything to say before I before I start. Well, you know, mostly I just found the, uh, you know, the whole idea of this really fascinating. You know, I read this, uh, this book on emotions and, you know, and, and, and one of the things they said is that the better that, you know, that we are able to, uh, you know, visualize within ourselves, you know, what a particular emotion is. Uh, you know, the more conscious that we're going to be in, within kind of our reactiveness. And, and so when you said that you had, you know, possibly paintings for, you know, for that, for that diagram of all the, you know, the, 
all the various feelings within the, you know, the good mother, the, you know, the, the terrible witch, et cetera, et cetera. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, this is like, it, it's, it's such a, you know, a great way to, to make it uh, personalize and, and, you know, to try to recognize these things. So I was, I was pretty excited by this and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Well, good. Um, uh, Craig, I wonder if you can make me a, a host or, or can I just share the screen the way it is? See if, if you guys can see this. Yes. Okay. Um, does this still work? Do you get, are you getting a full screen here? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, I was, I was really uh, intrigued by this whole idea because for all of my life, I've been really aware of my own feminine dimension. And it's, for the first part of my life, it confused me a great deal. I did a lot of, uh, Oh, I'm not, I'm not able to get my, there, that worked. So these are some of the uh, images that I created during the, the first parts of my career. Um, a lot of female figures that were, that loomed large in my awareness and uh, it wasn't until earlier in the year, in the last year, that I think it was Jan that introduced me to Maria Louise von Franz's idea that there were four aspects to the, to the anima. I just hadn't heard of that before. And then Craig gives us this diagram from the, the great mother. And all of a sudden, all of these images started to make cognitive sense to me. I mean, they made emotional sense to me, but, um, but I was really thrilled to be able to, to come to terms with the whole scope of the feminine principle. And I figured, wow, I've done so many hundreds and thousands of images that it would be kind of cool to map some of these um, and just see what I come up with. And so we're, we're starting with the, the diagram in Eric Nauman's book, The, the Great Mother. Um, in this case, I've simplified it by erasing a whole bunch of stuff because it's, it's kind of confusing and it's a little bit clunky. But what we've got here are, is the basic structure of his diagram. And I want to point out, there are two axes, the maternal axis that proceeds from the upper left to the lower right, and the anima axis from the top right to the lower left. And uh, I can't use my pointer as a, my cursor is a pointer here, but um, um, the, the maternal access is, is primary. And it, it is the, um, the basic physical reality of the development of any living thing. So I think of it both in terms of the evolution of humanity out of life and also the evolution of a single person from childhood to adulthood. So if you look at this central circle, it's labeled containing. And to me, that is the early development where the, like the infant is held in the embrace of the mother and is, uh, Um, and is protected 
and nurtured in that embrace. It's, it's kind of like that, that inner circle is like the Garden of Eden. It's unconscious and, and totally natural. And the, what the mother energy does is pulls the individual out toward the upper left there through bearing and releasing. And the person is then transformed, gains consciousness and, uh, and proceeds toward the birth of something new. And as Craig was talking about earlier, there's a negative aspect of that where, you know, the mother also wants to hold the son from leaving home and that's in toward the lower right direction, holding fast, fixating and ensnaring is the, is the aspect that keeps one from transforming into natural growth. And it goes down t toward the direction of death. And, um, and that's the pole of the terrible mother. And crossways to that is the anima access, which is the transformative, the spiritual transformative access. And so, again, starting in the middle, um, the, the development of consciousness proceeds through giving into a transformation that leads onward to a greater development of inspiration in the direction of the positive anima. And the negative aspect of that is the rejection and deprivation that um, prevents that kind of individuation and leads down into madness in the direction of the negative pole of the anima. So the the characters um, in the in the diagram are indicated here. The the for instance, the upper upper right. There's Mother Mary, Demeter, and Isis. That sort of are exemplifying of the the good mother and the production of of fruit, which is the, um, the culmination of that whole growth process. It's not just becoming an adult, it's, it's becoming an adult and creating the fruit that is the beginning of the next generation or the seed. Um, and on the upper right, again, you have Mary, but this time as a virgin, Sophia, the muse, these are all the positive kind of spiritually uplifting characters. And down below, right below that, you have toward the, the terrible mother, Kali Hecate, um, the kind of terrifying goddesses. And over to the left in the negative anima, you've got Lilith and Cirque Astarte, the, um, the kind of, um, terrifying um, characters involved in madness and the mysteries of drunkenness. So one of the things that he points out in his description is the, the characters in the bottom part of this diagram are more primitive and the ones in the upper part are more developed. And what you see in this diagram is I've added the color, um, the color parts are really my own kind of making sense of this because it's a little bit of a clumsy diagram. But um, let me see if I can change my screen a little bit here. Okay, I guess I'm gonna have to do it this way so you can see all of this. Um, so 
to me, the, I'm, I'm adding a, a segment of movement here. So it, it feels to me that life pulls us from the inside to the, out, to the outside. And the, um, the elements of, of attraction operate in, in different ways. To me, the body responds to allure. So anything that, that has like a, the beauty of, of a, an attractive character like um, Aphrodite or something, it's speaking to the blood of the body and the, the body responds by, by um, by going inward in this diagram. And the soul responds to the vision, which pulls it outward. Um, so that's kind of the, the um, dynamics of this particular diagram. And what I, one of the things that I found really fascinating was the extreme poles are not endpoints. So the, the four poles are places of transformation, they're turning points. So what I did was I tried to, to kind of paste this onto a globe that you see in the lower right here. And it seems to me that, that what consciousness does is gives us the ability to understand these things in a, um, in a cognitive way but the reality is most of it is mysterious. It's in the dark part of the, of the globe that is outside of our awareness. It's kind of like the dark side of the moon. We can only intuit what goes on there. So meanwhile, I started to place on this diagram some of the characters that I respond to personally. And I put those in red here, Angel, Aphrodite, Eve in the center. Salome down toward the bottom. And one of the things that I found really interesting about this, if you look in the upper right, you see Artemis, that's kind of pulling my attention off the edge of the spectrum. In reality, um, or in this, um, in this metaphor, it, it, it doesn't go off the edge, it goes around the globe and appears on the other end. So Artemis to me feels like it appears on both ends of that um, of that pole, the positive and the negative end. So the the front part of it is conscious, the back part is unconscious, and all of this is just an attempt to understand the emotional um, dynamics of of the feminine principle. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize that I'm talking both about my own kind of subjective experience of life and also the whole collective because we live in a patriarchal society. This is true about the entire uh, modern civilization that, that these um, dynamics are operable. And another thing I've added to, to Neumann's diagram is, some, is an aspect of um, the emergence of the archetypes that have to do with time or the, uh, the, what, I, what I think of as the personal engagement. So there are some of these archetypes that poke out at me that I feel really engaged with and others are just kind of fall off into the distance. And so what I decided I could do with this is to, um, is to map a lot of my artworks in um, using this diagram so I could make sense to myself of, of where these things fit. So this is, this is just kind of a smattering of where some of my own artworks fit on this spectrum. 
So I'm going to take you through a few of them and uh, just kind of get your um, maybe your comments on how this unfolds. One of the first images I did with any kind of awareness was about in the latter part of the 80s when I started uh, studying Jung and recognizing right away as soon as I read about the anima that this was absolutely true for me, that there's this feminine character in me that is very strong that I didn't know anything about. And I did this painting, it's called A Vision Come Out. And to me, this lies, that the source of this painting lies totally off on the dark side of the moon in the unconscious region. And it wasn't until I started to understand more about the dynamics of the anima that I was able to start um, giving some form to what I was feeling. So this is another early work called The Siren Goes to Work. And what I'm, what I'm experiencing here is just this sense of the, um, of the sacred song that I hear from the spiritual realm. And this is, as you can see, it's pretty close to the, to the inner circle. A lot of these earlier works are pretty close to the, to the center elementary character. Here's another one called the Black Madonna. And one thing I recognize about these early paintings is, and this one in particular, uh, it has all these characteristics that could go in any direction. It's nebulous enough and attractive enough that it could be the source of spiritual transformation, or it could be an ensnaring um, figure that leads me in a direction of drunkenness or disorder. Here's another one that has the same sort of characteristic. It's, it's a little bit more inspirational, but it, it could also be kind of an evil influence or a, a demonic kind of influence. And it was about um, a few years later when I was able to understand the dynamics of the anima that I began to see the character of my muse. And fortunately for me, I had this incredible encounter with a real woman who came to model for me. And I was able to have her come into the studio knowing that what I was experiencing was the presence of a goddess, that I was not dealing with a human being, that she was just a carrier for a greater um, character that I was just projecting onto her. So this is an example of that, the bird of paradise. And as you can see, I'm placing it way up there in the, in the mis mystical spiritual realm. Uh, very close to Mary and Sophia in this diagram. Um, and you, you'll also notice that the, where I'm placing these is farther out from the center. So it's more, there's more transformation happening. There's more consciousness. And I'm very aware of the power of these images. So this one strikes me as being really alluring and sexy, but it's also um, the voice of wisdom and inspiration, a lot, of, uh, a lot of upper realm sorts of energies in this one called Mirabai. So that process was really attractive for me I mean, I found in the muse this incredible beauty and attraction and, and spiritual uplift, but it was also pretty painful. Uh, this one on the left, she's screaming me, comes from that same part of the diagram. And the one on the right, the wild woman, 
um, is speaks of the the kind of rising out of the elemental earthy kind of sexual being of the of the feminine character and then on the other end of the spectrum is images like this that feel very fruitful to me they are not so much about the spirit they're about the the kind of elaborately beautiful um voluptuous um sensual elements that to me are suggestive of flowers and nature and the beauties of the the grand kind of chemical and material design of the world so the great ornament goddess is sort of a an awareness of that incredible natural beauty and I tried to think of one that that is really more of the Mother Mary kind of image. This is one I did um, that that tries to to uh, access that energy of the like the Eastern Orthodox uh, icon an image of contemplation and peace and, and uh, ultimate spiritual uplift. And we, we never see these images using a nude. The, the nude in Western culture is always associated with earthiness and sexiness and, and sort of the opposite of spirituality. And for me, it was really helpful to see this diagram because the spiritual is not disconnected from the earthy. It's part of the unfolding of nature with a spiritual awareness. And so I find in the nude and in particular, the, the female nude, um, this amazing wisdom of, of nature and, and the, the stunning beauty that is exemplified in the female form. Here's Artemis and Acteon. This is a pretty straightforward illustration of this kind of energy that I've often felt that the, the allure of the feminine has this kind of infuriating and deadening, not deadening, but um, um, really dangerous quality. And I've always had a hard time making sense of this. And one of the reasons I think that is the case is because it is so close to the edge of the, of the pole. So in my global uh, spherical concept of this diagram, um, the Artemis energy takes me over the edge into the, into the dark side of the moon and around the other side. And so it appears on, on both the negative and the positive spectrum. I noticed that as much as I loved the muse and I was so captivated with the beauty of this revelation that she was accompanied by this really dark force that I didn't understand, that I began to call the Duende after the Iberian concept of sort of the, the beauty of the destructive part of the creative process. And so you can see this monster emerging from behind her this drawing is called the muse is not alone and i'm putting it way over on the right hand side by sickness and the devouring goddess and she herself becomes this monster that is totally consuming 
this is a huge drawing. It's about five feet tall. And I call it the maw. And I think it, it very well describes the kind of feeling I had about the devouring quality of the muse. And there's also, here's a couple of them that are really wide on the bottom end of the spectrum. The emissary to me feels like um, the edge of insanity and the teeth collie on the right is sort of the destructive, um, captivating muse that is going to somehow devour my personality. Um, and the result of that in the huntress, you know, I've been defeated and, and somehow she has overtaken me. And the one on the right, the giantess, just feels like this enormous, um, powerful woman who is so much bigger than me that I just stand no chance in, in being myself in her presence. And in terms of diminution in, in the uh, diagram, this is as close as we can get to that is in my work. So it, it eventually becomes so terrifying and so um, hard to deal with. On the right is the upward hurricane. It's hard to see, but the little figure of me is down at the bottom, just right above the title there. This guy holding his head, you know, screaming. <laughs> and the, the elemental force of the duende is just wiping out the world. And that's very close to this, um, to this death aspect of the terrible mother. And on the drawing on the left, extraction, um, I can't stand it anymore. And I need to get this energy out of me just to be able to survive as an individual. So that's kind of uh, the extent of the human um, capacity to, to engage these negative forces. So as I, as I said before, one of the things that, that Neumann points out is the extremes morph into their opposites. And, the, and that always happens on an unconscious level. So if you think about the globe, here's the back end of the globe. This is the, the unconscious end where moving, moving into the direction of the extremes you're actually going around to the dark end of the planet. And he says that those trajectories cross somewhere in the unconscious realm. And of course we can never understand that because it always remains mysterious. So um, that gives you a little, um, a little taste of the kind of mapping I've been doing of my own experience of the of the feminine. And I kind of apologize that I wasn't able to give you the kind of beautiful, you know, meditative journeys that Gary and Adam have been providing for us. This is more of a kind of terrifying intellectual exercise, but um but if anybody has questions or anything they want to ask me, go ahead. Why don't we just start around the room, like Gary and let's, everybody, if you have any comments. Just... Well, you know, one of the things that I just found really fascinating about this is that, you know, how how some of the paintings could occur in two parts. And so, and, and, and it makes you think, especially with the conscious and the unconscious, is it's like, if it's in sort of the, dark half, if you will, you know, there's, there's the opportunity there for the transmutation over to the other side. But at the same time, you know, if, if it remains unconscious, it could get worse, you know? So it's like, you know, it, it has, it has a real 
you know, Jungian beauty to it. You know, I really, yeah, that was just incredible, Tim. I'm like, just my jaws dropping. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, I'm going to put here in the in the chat uh, one of the most remarkable experiences of my whole life was this ex was this encounter with my muse, and I did a museum exhibition about it called The Visitation by the Muse. And there's a, a video that I can share. I'll put that in the chat for you. So go ahead. Anybody else have questions? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's just hear everybody. Marina, do you have any comments? Yeah, I thought it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I was thinking as I was looking at the pictures, was I was thinking, oh, I wonder what our dialogues would be like. I wonder what it would be like to dialogue with your anima. Well, yes. And I was doing that this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a frustrating process. And as I mentioned before, you know, I'm, I wish that we'd had this conversation, you know, four hours ago. <laughs> I would have... I would have suggested to my anima that she that she tell me what you know the great mother is would say or something like that. But I'm always learning new new methods of dialoguing with her. What, what do you think, Adam? You're uh, I think you are kind of a brother of uh, Tim in some way. Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I um. I was curious, Tim, specifically the uh, the image that you had of extraction. Do you feel like that is something that you have done, or how would you, you know, have you been able to take that outside of yourself, or is it still in there? I mean, it's such a painful image. Yeah, I think all of these are just ongoing, yeah. and you know that reflects a particular. Um, a particular moment in time when I, I just realized I, you know, I couldn't handle it. And um, this experience with the visitation by the muse happened just after I had gotten married. And fortunately, my wife was very supportive of me, but we were all a little bit worried because this is right on the edge of psychosis. And I was I had a really good relationship with my pastor, who's the guy that actually introduced me to Jungian thought. And so I would go to him every week or two and say, you know, am I going crazy or am I still doing okay? <laughs> and uh, um, and he, he gave me, he kept me grounded and he uh, made sure that I was doing certain exercises to... Uh, to make sure I was being responsive to the world and not just falling into psychosis. And thank God for art. I mean, it's, it's the ability to do expressions like what you saw that kept me from falling into it. Because if I could express myself and, and put it out into the world, then the pressure was released to a certain degree. And so that pressure has gone up and down over the years. And um, the more artwork I do, you know, the pressure releases and then I start to relax a little bit and it builds up and, oh my God, I've got to get back to it. <laughs> How about you, Jordy? Do you have any comments? Thank you. Yes. Uh, pleasure wise, this is one of the most enjoyable Zooms of this year, 2021. <laughs> well, thank you. It seems you have had some turn, Tim. Uh, again, uh, you can be a clear and brilliant uh, presenter. Well, I am giving feedback for free. I, I'm not your cheerleader. I'm just yeah. an objective observer. Now, I will want to share something, and, and I don't want to be too clever by half, but when I listen to you people talking about the anima, it reminds me to a French well-known uh, author named Flaubert, who wrote a book called Madame Bovary. And he says, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. She's me. Yeah. 
She is me. Anima, c'est moi. And all that skin, c'est moi. And we are disembodied. I mean, uh, that humbles. We are not connected. Uh, we are detached to the parts of ourselves. And we have to deal with that. Uh, some clever people say it's our karma. I am not a friend of using that type of terminology, but it can make sense. Now, uh, it's not because it's Sunday afternoon here, I, I am in the light mood, but again, I am enjoying. And actually I have a soft spot for, for, for Neumann or Newman and his wife who closed his practice as psychologist and made some money uh, doing card readings and horoscopes and things in Tel Aviv, as a matter of fact. Oh. Because the uh, Nauman's wife was as well trained as he was, but he oh. switched career he become a when she became a widow. Now, I have reread recently the history, Origins and History of Consciousness, which I do recommend. It's a clear, well-written book. And uh, the, uh, the one who sent us now, the, the great mother thing, is something I had in the to-do list competing with other 30 books, I mean. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, a motivator. Yeah. Well, that's but great. The way, the, way, the way you navigated with your schemes was short of brilliant. And the way you uh, uh, staked with your art and your perceptions was again brilliant and light. I mean, it's difficult to do these things without uh, killing people with boredom. Well, I appreciate that. I feel like I'm stumbling all the time because it's so hard to articulate. Yeah. You know, you what. Did a brilliant job here. I mean, uh, a brilliant and an enjoyable thing. Oh, good. Well, thanks. And you also reminded me, one, one of my favorite Flaubert quotes is, um, is something that I, I sort of do, I try to do in my life, which is be ordinary and plebeian in your everyday life that you might be violent and creative in your work. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> Achilles, do you have any comments or... Uh... Or do, or do you want to uh, have any uh, thing to say? Uh, feel free. Or Angel, or how about you? Angel, did you have uh, want to say anything? Uh, maybe you don't have a microphone. I don't see one. Uh, but feel either one of you, feel free to talk. Uh, Carlos, did you have anything to say? Or Kathy? I'm sure Charles has a couple comments. Do you have any comments, Charles? Um, yeah, I mean, I just thought it was super cool. Um, it was really awesome being able to see all these like visual representations. Um, and it felt like really, you know, really genuine and like, um, you know, some of the aspects I, you know, I guess are parts of the anima that I haven't really experienced too much, so I couldn't like relate to them, but the things that I have experienced, I was like, yeah, that's really genuine and that seems to be a really accurate visual presentation and just the whole, um, I mean, even just the like, globular like 3d model of it like taking it from a flat image to like the three dimensions was really cool and um it was very well thought out and uh informative and yeah it was it was really good I enjoyed it yeah well thanks i forgot to give my apologies to neumann for messing with his diagram but these are just the ways that i that it makes sense to me i also want to respond to a a question that Jan put in the chat, how does the enantiodromia possibly fit with this process? And that's one of the things that has been really fascinating to me because you can't, you can't ever fall off the edge of the world. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you can fall into psychosis and 
uh, one of the things that, that Jung said was, you know, the deeper you go, there's, there's a point where if you go any deeper, you are going to end up in psychosis. And so just in order to maintain your, um, your integrity as a living being on the earth, you, you can't just dive to the very bottom. But this idea of, of uh, there being a dark side to the globe, um, it feels to me like if you go in any one of these directions, like for instance, the Virgin Mary, it seems like if you go in that direction toward you know, the, the perfection of the good mother, you can go so far in that direction that you end up on the other end um, sort of courting death. Um, I, I'm fascinated with the human creative ca capacity. And of course, being an artist, that's, um, that's not only how I make my living, but it's sort of how I make my life by trying to be creative. But if I go too far in, in the direction of the muse and just be um, lost in her world, I end up on the other end of that, um, on the other end of that diagram, having gone around the dark side of the globe in, in that place of madness, because you lose, you lose touch with um, the orientation that keeps you in the conscious world. I think to me, that's, that's how the en enantiodromia works, how one turns into its opposite. Uh, does our phone uh, person do you would you like to say a few words or I don't know if you have or have ability to talk but feel free if you do. Uh, anyway, well, Tim, the clarity was absolutely amazing. So uh, I'm going to rewatch this, but thank you so much. And uh, well, yes, and I. I would encourage anybody that's, that's got access to the Great Mother to read a couple of chapters that, that he wrote about the diagram. There's, there's a lot more yeah. detail, and I'm very impressed with you know, just his cognitive ability to be able to parse all this stuff. Now that's, you know, I'm, I'm much more familiar with the erotic end of the spectrum, and so you know, I do all this stuff in paint and in and in emotion and music and all kinds of other things, it's, it's harder for me to, to kind of put, um, apply the logos to it. But having done so, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm just so grateful to, uh, to have put these two parts together. Yeah, it's, it's and amazing. If we get a chance to do, to do more study about, about this diagram and what it means for people, I'd, I'd love to yeah. do that. Well, maybe we can have a session on it. I would say uh, when you're reading uh, The Great Mother, it's almost, you might even want to skip the first chapter because it's, I don't know if you read it, Tim, but it's, you kind of get bogged down. He's trying to explain what he's going to do. And he, when, when you get to the transformative part, that's, that's what really speaks to me. You know, I mean, the introductory aspects are okay, but you, you have to be a little bit of patience. You know, sometimes I get a little impatient, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, I thank everybody. And next time we'll just, uh, we're going to discuss the Indian visions. And uh, uh, we really start to get into these, uh, the Christiana Morgan, even though it, it didn't end well for her, her, her art and her visions were absolutely uh, amazing. And, and this whole, uh, like, uh, Two, two or th three or I don't know how many years it lasted and then if we do the one that they skipped in here the kundalini yoga uh that is it is worth it I, I mean I have never read a young a book by young that more um just sat me you know in my seat than the, his seminars in the vision seminars on kundalini yoga but anyway thank you everybody and we'll see you next time I appreciate it Hello, uh, Craig. Yeah. I second the Kundalini one. Yes. I, I'll send out a, a PDF for it, of it. 
I, I second to the, devote time to that and a petition, uh, a wish list to handle the manly masculine type of issues mm -hmm. on Neumann's scheme. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that comes in the uh, in the um, origins of human consciousness. The, yes. The masculine side. Yeah. If you notice in the Great Mother, he'll show the masculine side, and he says, "Well, that's in my first book." You know. Yeah. yeah so. I know. <laughs> no, but to to devote time and to and if someone uh, say volunteers to do what Tim has done today yeah. on the masculine side. Okay. Well, I will send out a PDF of both origins and uh, Kundalini yoga uh, later today. So uh, yes. anyway, uh, thank you everybody. And thank you, Tim, so much. It's just fabulous. My pleasure. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to next time. And thank you, Gary, for suggesting it. <laughs> okay. Bye guys. We'll see you Bye. later. <laughs>